Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Black Fest in conversation with the renowned poet, activist, and historian, Malik Al Nasser. Good morning, Taylor. Good morning. Sorry to be a little bit late. Um, some technical difficulties. But um, this is Black Fest in conversation with a local um, celebrity. Uh, so, Malik, tell us about growing up in Liverpool. Um, growing up in Liverpool um, as a black person um, wasn't the most um, easy of experiences. Um, having initially been born in Toxteth uh, in the late 60s, um, in a very kind of cosmopolitan area, even though there was difficulties, there was a great sense of community. Um, but then having been moved out to the uh, suburbs uh, where there were very, very few black families, life became a lot more difficult for us. Um, and then, you know, going through school in the 70s, um, there was a lot of racial tension. And if you were away from the sort of uh, core of the black community, um, you were exposed to uh, a lot of a lot of racism and a lot of uh, hostilities, um, particularly if you come from a mixed family. So my father's black, my mother's white. Um, so we had a very, very difficult time um, growing up during that period and it was not uncommon for um, children in mixed families to end up in the care system uh, at that time so, uh, in 1965 unfortunately I was taken into care and I was in care from the age of nine until uh, 18 uh, and that was quite a, a difficult experience to say the least um, what, where was it that you moved to so uh, we moved to the outlying areas of Liverpool. Um, a lot of Liverpool at that time had been decentralised, so they created a lot of council estates in the outlying areas. So they had like, you know, Kirby, Cantrell Farm, Netherley, Highton, Blue Belt. You know, there's a lot of places in the outlying areas where they moved um, people from the city centre out to. So all of those places were pretty much the same. They were predominantly white. They were pro predominantly people from the inner cities. They were densely populated, um, and uh, there was uh, traditional uh, hostility there towards uh, anyone who who was, you know, appeared to be foreign. Uh, so even though I was born in this country, I was treated as a foreigner. You know, um, not the foreigners should have been treated any different to people born in this country, but um, they had this perception that we didn't belong here. So, you know, early childhood memories would be like going back to where you came from. And I'm thinking, what, Warwick Street? Because <laughs> that's where I was born. But that was just the nature of, um, of, of 70s life in, uh, in, in Liverpool. And when you moved, uh, who was in the family? Um, so, you know, it was my, myself, my, uh, my mom, my dad, uh, my nan and uh, my siblings. And what happened that uh, made you be taken into care? About it. Well, my father unfortunately had a stroke and he became a quadriplegic and uh, when my mum was on her own with the kids and she was struggling to cope and there was a lot of hostility in school, we were fighting all the time, we were being called, you know, a lot of uh, racial uh, names and that would result in, in fights and then, you know, it was always our fault. Um, so as kids, we um, were constantly fighting to defend ourselves. But the teachers didn't see it that way, you know. Um, and unfortunately, at the age of nine, I was expelled from school. And at that point, the social services decided that they were going to take me into the care system. So um, that's what they did. Right. And you were in the care system till you were... Well, you're officially in care until you're 18 years old. So right. uh, at the age of 18, I was uh, dumped by the local social services into a hostel for homeless black youths. Um, in Toxteth, um, given £100 and told never to come back for any money. Right. It was a hostel for black youths. For homeless black youths. Homeless yeah. black youths. It's okay. called Ujama House. Right. <laughs> okay. And how long were you there for? Uh, in that particular hostel, probably about maybe just over a year. Okay. And presumably life in care and in that hostel was uh, quite uh, uncomfortable. I mean, it's, you know, it's not nice to be homeless, you know, um, it's not nice to be in a situation where um, you've been dismembered from your family, where you've been dismembered from your community, 
um, for many years, and then suddenly you're thrust back into your original community, back in Toxteth again, but nobody knows you because you didn't grow up in Toxteth, you know, you've grown up um, in outlying areas, you've grown up in the care system, you know, housing care homes in Warrington, in Manchester, you know, uh, sort of outside of the city. Um, so, you know, you're coming back to Toxteth now and people are like, who are you? Um, and then people, you know, they don't know you, you know, my father's dead at that point, so we didn't have that connection to the community anymore. Um, so, you know, even the family connection, you know, with regard to my, uh, my mum and, and my siblings was severed. So I still knew them, you know, I, I visited them from time to time. We didn't have that bond that you would have when you grow up together because we didn't grow up together. Um, so it was very difficult to sort of reassert yourself into, um, into family life or into community life when you've been completely dismembered from, from both. And then the care system, which was your only family, albeit a very dysfunctional one, um, is uh, rejecting of you at the age of 18. You're just told you're no longer in care. And, you know, you sign this paper and they give you £100 and that's it. They, they're officially no longer responsible for you. So there's no long, you know, no uh, ongoing support or transitional arrangements or anything like that. You're just literally done. This is 19... 19- 85. Yeah. You clearly survived that. Can you say what happened? Um, I mean, I survived it not because of anything that was done by the state. Uh, you know, I survived the state. Yes. Um, it was uh, very uh, fortunate for me that in 1985 I uh, met an artist and activist called Gil Scott Heron, uh, who was incredibly kind to me. And uh, how, so, do you, how does somebody like how does somebody like you meet Gil Scott Heron? I just snuck backstage at a, at a show in Liverpool at the World Court, and I got to meet him, and we got talking, and you know he was very interested in what was happening in Liverpool at the time because we'd had the riots in '81, and uh, when Gil came to Liverpool, there were a lot of people that wanted to talk to him about the issues in the black community. So at the show, there was the um, the Liverpool Black Caucus had arrived. And they gave Gil a T-shirt and asked him to wear the T-shirt for the show, which he did. Um, and the Black Caucus had formed out of the riots. Um, it was a consortium of, of black organisations that were um, representing the black community at that time. So we had um, also Leroy Cooper, who was the guy who had sort of triggered the riots. It was his arrest that started the Toxteth riots. He'd become a poet and, and he was supporting Gil that night. So there were a lot of activists um, at the show. And, you know, there'd been a meeting with Gil of these guys before the show to explain the issues that Liverpool was facing. And Gil had taken the time to listen to these guys, agreed to wear the Black Caucus T-shirt and agreed to allow Leroy Cooper to do his poetry before the show. So there was already this um, series of questions that Gil had with regard to what was going on in Liverpool. And and he was a very insightful individual and he always... Um, sort of really, you know, get underneath things and, and find out what the real issues were. Mm-hmm. So I suppose when we'd met after the show, he saw that perhaps as an opportunity to really get um, sort of another insight, if you like, into post-drive talk stuff and, and what was really going on. And then, you know, the next day they had a day off. You know, I invited them to have a meal. Um, I borrowed a flat from a friend of mine because I didn't have anywhere to, to live at that time other than the hostel. Couldn't take them back there. Um, so I um, cashed my gyro, which was what we used to get the money in those days from the government, and um, purchased a big load of food and uh, cooked uh, a meal at my friend's house. And Gil invited his whole entourage, and they came back, and I entertained them to a meal, and they were impressed. And afterwards, he was leaving. He tried to give me some money. I refused to accept the money. And then he said to the promoter, um, tell him you know, where we're going to be when we come back to England. We're going off to Europe. We'll be back in two weeks. When we come back, uh, tell him where we are, take his details. And tell him or tell them? Tell me right. uh, where, where we're going to be in London. And, uh, and I would like him to come with us. We're going to take him on tour, um, which was a shock to me. I'd never been to London. Uh, and then two weeks later, sure enough, I got a phone call from the promoter. And they called me up and said, come to London. And um, yeah, we're taking you on tour. So uh, that was it. That was the beginning of uh, years of touring and traveling the world with the with Gil Scott Heron and his, and his band. And throughout that process, he taught me, he mentored me, he encouraged me to uh, 
to, to learn uh, to become literate. I mean, I was only semi-literate at that point. I hadn't had much uh, education at all. I've had two years of secondary education. I'd missed two years of primary education. I had, you know, no qualifications of worth. And, um, you know, I was in a sort of a state of relative destitution. Um, so his mentoring and support was, I think, the thing which really sort of got me out of that state and into a state where I could um, start to learn to read and write properly, to educate myself. Um, and then over the years, I gradually progressed through that process, uh, moving on, going to college, university. I did a first degree um, in uh, geography and sociology, and then I did a postgraduate diploma, and then I went on to do a master's degree. And now I'm about to start my PhD. Okay, before we get to the PhD, um, was it on the Gill's tutelage that you started writing poetry, or had you started writing poetry as a boy in a cat? Um, no, it was under Gill's tutelage. I think the last poem I ever wrote was in school before I was taken into care, right. um, which was uh, a poem about the summer holidays, was my first poem. And, right. But, you know, you have to understand at the age of nine, my world stopped. It was like I went into a state of suspended animation where education was concerned. The education that I had up until the age of nine was pretty much the education that I had at 18 right. because what we'd done throughout the care system was, even though they had these classes, um, so-called, um, there were people of mixed ages, so you could have a nine-year-old and a 16-year-old in the same class. And um, the work that they did was very rudimentary, very basic. Um, you didn't work towards qualifications. There were no qualifications to be taken within the institution. Um, <clears throat> so there was no milestones in terms of preparing for, you know, what they had at that time, which was O levels, which would be the equivalent of GCSEs. Now there was no, uh, there was no requirement for you to do any of that. So there was no um, encouragement to do education. So we did a lot of manual labor, you know, farming and, and woodwork and, and things like that. So, you know, there was the, the poetry itself came as a result of Gil saying, well, you know, if you're going to learn anything, you have to be literate. And because you're in a kind of state of semi-literacy, like my reading wasn't fluent. Um, and, and Gil had identified that because he gave me a book and said, read it. And I was fumbling. And then he sort of, you know, identified, look, you know, you've got a literacy problem. You need to address it. And poetry is a way of, of doing that. So, you know, I started off um, teaching myself, uh, you know, to, to read very carefully and slowly and, you know, breaking down words and syllables and, and trying to become more and more fluent with them and using the poetry as a means to um, kind of understand how to manipulate words and, and use language. And um, so the poetry was a means to an end. It wasn't poetry to become a poet. It was poetry to learn how to read and write properly and how to use language properly um, with the hope of them being able to go and, and, and get an education, which I did. So once the poetry had sort of been written and there was this whole body of work, um, it, was, it was really just a question of saying, um, I've accomplished that now. I now know how to read and write properly. I can now go and get an education, which is what I did. Um, and the poetry was part for many, many years. Um, it was never intended to, uh, to be published. So the education was where? Um, well, I went to uh, Millbank College first mm -hmm. on day release. Um, I got a job with the Little Woods organization under Linda Loy, um, who is a local community activist who was one of the Liverpool Aid Defence Committee after the riots. And Linda, uh, along with Peter Bassey, had set up the um, entry to business scheme at Little Woods organization, which was uh, with John Moores. Uh, John Moores, the namesake of John Moores University, was also an honorary member of the Liverpool Aid Defence Committee. He had um, agreed with uh, with the LA Defence Committee that um, he would take some measures within his own company to promote equal opportunities. And I think he set up the first equal opportunities department in Liverpool um, at Little Woods, and they would employ four black people a year and train them in management. Um, so I did store management for three months and then you had another 12 months where you would uh, be seconded to any part of the Little Woods organisation to, um, to, to work in whichever field 
you chose. And then they would also pay for you to go to day release to do a BTEC in business and finance. So um, I chose uh, group public relations, uh, home shopping marketing, and then I moved over to Index, which was a chain of stores that they had, which was like a competitor to Argos. And they had about 100 stores. And whilst I was there, they opened another 20. And I became the national marketing coordinator for Index, like basically nationwide. Um, so when my tenure finished, um, I didn't get kept on. So, you know, the thing was that they would, equal opportunities would pay your salary for 15 months at the end of 15 months. Um, you know, it was hoped that you would get a job. Um, but I was realizing that all the jobs I was applying for internally, I was being um, beaten by graduates. Um, and a lot of them didn't have experience, but they were graduates. So I realized at that point that the only way I was going to be able to even hope to compete um, in, in that sphere was to go to university. So in 1992, I left Little Woods and I went to um, Hope University and I did a, a, a BA honors in uh, geography and sociology. Okay. Um, and this is, can you tell me <clears throat> the kinds of places that you visited when you were touring with Bill Scott Barron? Because oh. that was a large part of education, I'm sure. Well, being with Gil Scott Heron was an education. It was, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, he was an incredibly intellectual individual. Um, he was politically one of the most astute people you would ever encounter. Um, so I suppose my education with Gil uh, was a combination of the geopolitics of what was happening in the world. Uh, he was very actively involved in the Artists United Against Apartheid. So at that time, Nelson Mandela was still in prison. Um, white minority rule was still happening in South Africa. And, um, you know, the Tories were in government and, and supporting, uh, Thatcher's government was supporting apartheid and supporting keeping Mandela in jail. So the Artists United Against Apartheid were um, raising the issue of um, the evils of, um, of racial segregation and, and the apartheid system in South Africa, and also um, championing the cause of, of freeing Nelson Mandela. So um, I became quite aware of the, um, the anti-apartheid struggle through Gil and also um, some of the other uh, luminaries of that struggle, like, you know, Stephen Bantu Biko, um, you know, uh, Hugh Masekela, uh, Miriam McCabe, uh, you know, there's a whole uh, set of people, Joe Slovo, um, you know, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu, you know, these were all people who were fighting against apartheid. And there was a contingent of our anti-apartheid activists um, here who were um, based in Liverpool. Two of Oliver Tambo's sons were here in Liverpool, and uh, Mbabala Mpetha, who was the son of uh, Oscar Mpetha, who'd been um, incarcerated at Polsmore Prison with... Um, with, uh, um, so I got to know those guys as well and, and you know, was assisting them. Uh, also, a, a South African uh, brother came over and, and uh, we shared a, an apartment together for, for about six months there uh, named Omar Hendricks. So he taught me a lot also about what was happening in South Africa. But the Artists United Against the Apartheid Movement spawned the Free Mandela Movement. And it was then the Free Nelson Mandela Concert at Wembley Arena that really was the main thing um, that succeeded in, in convincing the world that apartheid had to come to an end. And then there was that pivotal moment where um, eventually uh, President de Klerk realized that this was an untenable situation and he had no choice but to free Nelson Mandela. Um, it wasn't for want of political will from the, uh, from the international community. They were very supportive of apartheid. It was more to do with the, um, with the, with the, the grassroots movement um, both internally within South Africa, fighting the apartheid system, and those people who'd gone outside and were raising um, the uh, cause of the anti-apartheid movement outside. And that was being championed by um, people in the arts industries, and particularly in the case of musicians, the Artists United Against Apartheid. They had a huge concert at, um, at uh, Hyde Park, uh, which Gil performed on. And then obviously... And you were there? Uh, no, I missed the high part. That was like yeah. the, the year before I joined. Or, or maybe the year I joined, I was thinking it was 84. Mm -hmm. uh, I joined in uh, so the same year, but I missed that particular concept. But um, that was one of the um, triggers, if you like. 
for what later became the uh, Free Mandela concerts at Wembley Arena, which I think put that issue on the world stage. Yeah. And at that point, it was, you know, I was kind of like the, 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 when the wall came down, as it were, and, and Mandela was free. And, you know, Musicians United for Safe Energy, which was an anti-apartheid movement. Uh, sorry, Musicians for United, United for Safe Energy was a, a campaign for nuclear disarmament um, that he was also involved in. Um, there was the um, Sun City uh, Bantu stands, which were these places that had been formed by the apartheid government, which um, they were inviting people to um, to come and play there and offering great amounts of money. Um, Gil and uh, Little Stevie and Miles Davis and a group of other people had, um, had done an album called, you know, Sun City, uh, where they articulated the problem with the Bantu stands in South Africa and they refused to play Sun City and they did the album. And there was also Stevie Wonder and Gil Scott Heron had done the Happy Birthday Tour, um, which was for Martin Luther King Jr. to have his, his birthday recognised as a national holiday, uh, which it now is. We now have Martin Luther King Day. Thanks again to artists as activists. Yeah, so this is this is where the arts and the activism are, are, are fused, if you like, and, and that was really the origins of, of my artistic uh, activism because I, although I was seeking to gain education mm. to uplift myself from, you know, poverty and, and so on, um, I wasn't seeking at that point to be an artist, but by default, I developed a body of work which had artistic value. And it was later on that I sort of recognised the value of that and decided to publish it. One question. Gil was American. Mm -hmm. So in all this activity surrounding South Africa, mm -hmm. was he educating you about what had been going on in the United States? Yeah, I mean, elsewhere? yeah, the geopolitics of, of the world. If you listen to Gil Scott Heron's uh, songs, you'll hear... Johannesburg, the song Johannesburg, which is talking about obviously the situation that was happening in South Africa with the, the, the miners' strikes and, and what had happened, uh, you know, in, in the apartheid era. Um, but you can hear um, songs like Angola, Louisiana, uh, which is about the Angola State Penitentiary in Louisiana um, and the incarceration of, uh, of Gary Tyler, you know, um, who was, you know, also the subject of a UB40 song. You know, Tyler is guilty, the white judge, he said so. You know, um, Gary Tyler had written to uh, his mother had written to Gil, and you know said say something to to my son, and he wrote the song Angola, Louisiana, right. um, to to highlight the uh, the plight of Gary Tyler before UB40 did their song about Gary Tyler. Um, so you know, Gil was comparing um, you know uh, what was happening in in South Africa with what was happening in South Carolina, for instance. So he had an album from South Africa to South Carolina um, and basically talking about the, you know, the base, you know, the, the, the political landscape of a post kind of antebellum South, um, you know, a plantation slavery kind of economy um, that was comparable, you know, in terms of its Jim Crow and segregation to what was happening in, uh, in, in South Africa under apartheid. So Gil drew parallels between that, but he talked about Patrice Lumumba, he talked about, you know, what was happening with Steve Biko, he talked about um, things that were happening in Cuba uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis, he was talking about, you know, what was happening with uh, President Nixon and the Bay of Pigs invasion, and, you know, um, uh, what happened, you know, with, with, with Johnson and, and, the, and the Vietnam War, you know, so there's a whole range of different political uh, things that were happening, Ronald Reagan, the re-election of Ronald Reagan, um, and his association and sort of special relationship with, with, with Margaret Thatcher in the song Rerun. You know, there's a whole, when you go through Gill's body of work, you find a geopolitical um, narrative across a whole range of, of subjects um, right across the world. I mean, he was talking about uh, what was happening in Poland with Lech Walensky and the Gdansk shipyard yeah. when those people were um, fighting against communism and, and trying to get freedom for, for the people of, of Poland, you know, Morning Thoughts, he talks about, you know, shine sunshine down in Zimbabwe, you know, and, and, and Liberia. Um, as you go through his body of work, you'll find so many things to um, go and research, yeah. you know. So this is an American introducing you to geopolitics worldwide. Mm -hmm. 
you as a Brit with a Welsh mother in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And a Guyanese father. And a Guyanese father. Mm -hmm. So at what point did you decide to start researching your own Guyanese ancestry? Well, I think it was a cumulative effect of a number of um, sort of factors. Um, one of them was, as a child, being constantly told to go back to where you came from. Yeah. Um, and as I say, as I said earlier, you know, I was thinking like, what do they mean Warwick Street, you know, in <laughs> Liverpool where I was born. Um, but obviously people say that because they look at your skin tone and they assume that you're from somewhere other than here. Um, and, and there's a sense there as a child, it's quite a traumatic experience to be told that as a child, especially by adults, by white adults, because they're making you feel like you don't belong here, that even though this is the place that you're born, it's the only place you know, you have no roots and connection anywhere else, that um, you're somehow invading their space, you're somehow um, taking something that doesn't belong to you, you're, you're, you're um, somehow, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, unwelcome, absolutely. Mm. So <clears throat> when you're being told that as a child, it does have a negative impact on your psyche um because you're made to feel constantly as if you're like a, a kind of a, a refugee in the country that you were born um and and that's a hard thing for anyone to to um to reconcile within themselves growing up to have that sense that you don't belong um and and that does impact you because you then think to yourself well where do i belong so I had, at the age of 18, first got a job on the, on the ferry boats for a summer season. I used to sail to the Isle of Man and back, and I sort of got a sense that, you know, my father was a seaman, 35 years, Liverpool was a seaport. Everyone here had been a docker or a seaman, or their father had been a seaman or a docker, you know. So, you know, my father had been a seaman and a docker. Um, so I was like, well, okay, let me go to sea and get a chance to see the world, you know. So I traveled to sea, I spent about five years at sea, and I got to Angola, I got to Cameroon, I got to the US Virgin Islands, I got to America, I got to Colombia in South America, I got to Turkey, I got to Romania, you know, I got to many different ports in, in Europe. Uh, so I'd started to get a sense of, of the world. And in each of those places, I was gathering information about like what was going on there. And then when I would come home, I'd be home for a couple of months. I would tour with Gil Heron and I would discuss the places I'd been, the issues that were going on, the geopolitics of it. Um, and, and Gil would, uh, you know, would embellish that information um, with, with, you know, what he knew. So this was, a, this was an, a real life, you know, kind of global education that was happening, but not happening in a classroom setting, you know. Our classroom was the, was the tour bus um, or the hotels after the show. Um, and in my case, also the, uh, you know, the ship and the ports that we docked in uh, along the way. So, you know, I think there was a sense that I wanted to know what it was that my father had seen to make him want to come to Liverpool. Um, from Guyana. From Guyana, because he settled here in the 1930s. He never went back. Um, my father was born in 1918. So... You know, I had also got a sense that um, I need to have an identity that I can um, be comfortable with. Um, I'd been made, you know, to understand from the white community that I didn't belong with them. Um, in some cases, from the black community that I didn't belong with them. Um, I, I was, you know, obviously mixed race. Um, I didn't know Guyana. I'd never been to Guyana. Uh, my father had said, you know, one day I'm going to take you back and show you the sugar cane and that, you know, my father had got cane. And, um, and then obviously he passed away when I was a teen, so I never got that um, opportunity while, while he was alive. Um, and, you know, with Gil, I would sort of not just learned the politics, but I was also learning the industry because as we were moving through um, all of these uh, tours, you know, things were happening, records were being released, books were being released, stuff was being promoted, shows were happening, talks were being given, uh, you know, there was, you know, press events where, you know, press conferences and so on. So I was managing all of those different things. In Gil's press, I ended up um, road managing the uh, tours, I ended up 
roadieing this, you know, doing the stage, you know, um, doing the merchandising. So I learned every aspect, if you like, of the um, of the music business um, by default. Yeah. Just by by working with girls. So so my classroom was anywhere but the classroom. Exactly. Yes. You know. Okay. <clears throat> so going back to your Guyanese roots. Mm -hmm. Can you say what happened to make you delve into that? Yeah, so in 2008, um, I had the opportunity to go to Guyana um, with a researcher um, to look into um, the possibility of writing um, a children's book. So the researcher is a, a friend of mine called Dr. Tonya Leslie, and she had written a book in America, which had been on Oprah and so on and so forth. And we've been at university together. So she's based in New York. Um, she's done You've a been together at university in Liverpool. Yeah, she 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 was doing um, English um, as her undergraduate. So she was on an exchange program um, at Hope University, where she did a semester here, and we become friends, myself and her and her colleague um, Claudine Fong. So there was two of them Americans, and we were among the only black people in the year. So um, so uh, we sort of stayed in touch. And I'd been working at that time in New York doing um, some albums and Tonya had introduced me to uh, Wycliffe Jean. So I'd been working out of Wycliffe Studio um, in New York and I produced several um, album projects there uh, with Wycliffe's production team. And um, Tonya had, had this book published by, uh, I think it was uh, Scholastic possibly, um, but she'd had a book published anyway and it had been on Oprah. And I had also discovered um, a black footballer from the 19th century called Andrew Watson. And my father was uh, Reginald Watson, you know, we come from a long line of, of Watsons in Guyana. And um, when we discovered this, uh, this footballer, Andrew Watson, there were pictures of him and he looked just like me, but he was born in 1856. Born where? In Guyana, in oh. Demerara, the same name, same place, you know, same features, you know, it was... Um, it was uncanny. So I was clearly intrigued to see if there was a, a familial connection with him. Um, but I also wanted to research him and, and, and do a book on him. So I asked Tonya if she would be willing to do the research with me and to help to write a children's book about Andrew Watson for the purposes of, um, of publication. Uh, so revolutionary, but that was all, um, <laughs> because he had walked from London to Liverpool. So they say, look, Andy, slow train coming. <laughs> <laughs> so he was called Slow Train, and um, you know his friend was called Lucky, and you know there was hundred, you know because he'd slept with a hundred women, so they called him Hundred. So he was in Guyana, <laughs> and he knew my father before he come. So Lucky said to me, you know, go with Sour Pot, you know, this Slow Train boy Spart, of course, <laughs> you're gonna go to Guyana, go meet Hundred, he go tell you everything, you know. So the Spartacus Slow Train, Sour Pot, and Hundred, you know, okay. and Lucky. <laughs> So anyone from Liverpool will probably know, maybe they don't know 100, but they'll know all of those guys. Yeah. So you got to Guyana. And... So we got to Guyana and, um, <clears throat> and I met with 100 and, and his son, Brian. And um, Tonya did the research in the, uh, in the archives, trying to find Watsons uh, and particularly Andrew Watson. And I went out and did the field work, if you like, uh, with Brian, 100's son. And we hired a driver and he took us out into babies and so on. And uh, by twist of fate, I managed to find my family on both sides. I found my grandmother, Olivia July, her family. Uh, she was uh, Amerindian, what they call in Guyana, buck. You know, the people they go like sort of naked from the waist up and they have like a fringe and that straight hair. They like live in the round houses in the rainforest. So my grandmother was one of those. And um, native. Native, native, yeah. Land. So all, all the, um, the July family, because uh, her name was Olivia July, they were they married with black and buck, what they call black and buck in Guyana, which is the black African origin from slavery, mm -hmm. and the buck is the the, the Amerindian indigenous, um, and that's something that continued. So I met one guy there who had um, his grandmother and my grandmother were sisters, you know. So that was on the July side, and then on the um, on the other side there was a place called Weldad, and Sal Potter said your father was like he lived in Weldad. So we went to Weldad and we couldn't find any Watsons in Weldad. We found an old man who was 100 years old, uh, 96 or something like that. He was near to 100. 
And he said, yeah, there was a man used to come from the Belladrum, which is a Scottish name. There's lots of Scottish names in, in Guyana. There's, even the churches are called Kirks, Kirk, St. Andrew's Kirk and all of this, which is a Gaelic name for church. So they, um, they had a lot of Scottish uh, people out there and the Watsons were, were Scottish as well from Orkney. Um, so um, he said, yeah, there was a guy who used to come called Teacher Watson. And he used to bring the cricket team from Belladrum to Weldad because there's no school in Weldad. So he used to teach in Belladrum and then the cricket team would come and play in Weldad and they remember Teacher Watson. So this guy, he couldn't remember much details and he was old and he had cataracts and it was, you know, he was nearly 100 years old. So we got what information we could. And um, we see a white man. No, no, he's a black man. Uh, yeah. What? No, he's not a Watson. We're teacher. talking about Teacher Watson's black. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, okay. The, the hundred year old man, he's a black man. Yeah. Yeah. So he told me about Teacher Watson. Um, so I knew from my father's marriage certificate that his father was George Edward Watson and that his profession was schoolmaster. So obviously he was literate because my father was also very literate. Because on the ship they used to call him sea lawyer. So he had different names in different places. When he was in Guyana, they called him lard oil because he used to like to eat the bread and dripping that people used to eat in those days. And when he was at sea, because he knew all the rules on the ship and he was literate, and most of them guys were illiterate, they used to call him sea lawyer because he would always like interpret, you know, the rules of the ship and be like what the equivalent of what you would call a shock you today, although they didn't have humans. Okay, so so you found... So we found Teacher Watson, okay. a reference to Teacher Watson. Yeah. Um, but from Belladrum, not from Weldad. Mm. But there was a guy in Weldad called Mr. White. Mm. He was a rice farmer, and he had discovered um, his own family history. And people said, if you want to talk family history, speak to Mr. White. <clears throat> so we went there, and he was like, look, I don't know any Watsons here, because we don't have any. Um, but I'll take your details, and if I hear of anything, I'll let you know. How long are you here for? I'm like five days. So he said, okay. So I give him the details. Next day, I get a phone call. He was in the bank in Berbice, which is on the uh, eastern side of Demerara, uh, east of Demerara towards the uh, uh, Suriname. And he'd been in a bank and he'd overheard two old ladies talking. And one of them, she had a Dutch name, but her friend asked her, was, or the person she was talking to asked her, was that your um, maiden name or your married name? She said, no, that's my married name. So what's your maiden name? She said, Watson. <laughs> so he's just standing in a queue he overheard this so he said look there's an English guy here he's looking for Watsons can I give him your details and whatever she said yeah sure it turns out she was my first cousin with Aline she was 82 years old wow. and she had in fact when she was 8 years old in the 1930s she had actually lived um, with my father wow. um, for a period of time she didn't remember much because she was quite old and she was getting a bit frail um, but she remembered my father so they uh I was invited, anyway, I was invited to, to go to the house and I went to Babise um, the following day and we drove up the coast and we got there. And when I walked in the house, I just saw this picture on the wall and this little old lady. And I looked at the picture and I said, that's my father. And she said, that's my father. And I thought, oh my God, I've got an 82 year old sister, you know? <laughs> and then, and then she, I said, Reginald Watson. And she said, yes. And then I said, Reginald Wilcox Watson. She said, no. She said, Reginald Daniel William Watson. Reginald Wilcox Watson is my uncle. I said, ah, so then I realized that my grandfather had two children and he called both of them Reginald, but different middle names. Right. You know, they did some quirky <laughs> stuff in Guyana and they had with two different mothers. So uh, this was Henrietta Smith was the mother of my uncle Reg and then Olivia July was okay. the, the mother, the mother of my All right. uh, my grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> so that was the start of then starting to unravel, yeah. if you like, the, the 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 family history. So the family history in Demerara and Berbice and Berbice, mm -hmm. and what is the Scottish connection? Yeah. So the <clears throat> Scottish connection comes through plantation slavery. Right. You know. So I had been looking for references to Andrew Watson. Uh, the Scottish footballer because obviously he was famous at the time uh, in the UK. He had there was articles written about him in the Athletics Journal. There was reference to him and photographs of him in the Scottish football annuals because he had captained the Scottish national team in the 1880s. He as played a, for as a black Queen's man. Park as a black man, you know, which was unheard of in those days. 
And he also lived in Liverpool for a while and played for Brutal FC, which was the forerunner to Liverpool FC. So in those days, you didn't have Liverpool and Everton like you have now. You had um, Brutal and Everton. Um, so he had he had been, um, you know, quite well known and, and his life had been documented. Um, so I was still trying to find a connection with him and I traced his father, Peter Miller Watson, as a white Scottish sugar planter, which was what he was noted as on his uh, on Andrew's marriage certificate. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted to find evidence of him in Guyana. So when I got to the National Archives in Guyana, I found that there was a Peter Miller Watson registered to vote. And in those days, only white men could vote, women couldn't vote, black people couldn't vote. And it was only rich white men, poor people couldn't vote. So you had to have a qualification to vote. So on the voters list for 1856 in Demerara, there he was, Peter Miller Watson, and his qualification to vote was two plantations under cultivation of X amount of acres. One was called uh, Le Bon Intention, and the other one was called Plantation Zeebrugge. So I now had Peter Miller Watson, Andrew's father, in Guyana, but I also had the plantations that he owned. Uh, what I was then trying to investigate was any other family connections to him. And that was the beginning of a much bigger search into the Scottish ancestry and also the, um, the mercantile uh, slave operation that he was a, a, a significant part of. <clears throat> so in summary, you are a descendant of both people who were enslaved mm -hmm and people who were slave owners. Yeah, so that was the bit that I needed to, um, to, to ascertain because obviously if I was descendant, for instance, of Andrew Watson, um, his father was a white slave owner. So that would mean that I was descendant of white slave owners as well as slaves. But I couldn't make that connection and I, I, I'm still working on the precise details of that connection. But what I've found so far, <coughs> excuse me, is that Peter Miller Watson had um, two brothers who were also out there with him, William Robertson Watson, who was a plantation overseer, and Henry Robertson Watson. But Peter ran the entire operation for a company called Sandbach Tinney, which was one of the biggest uh, sugar and slave enterprises in Guyana during that period. Excuse me. So Peter Miller Watson was running the entire operation in Demerara, a man called Samuel Sambach was running the operation in Liverpool, and a man called Charles Stuart Parker was running the operation in Glasgow. So Glasgow was building the slave ships and providing the underwriting and the insurance. Um, Liverpool was selling the commodities and shipping out the goods that were needed in the colonies and commissioning the slave voyages. And Demerara were managing the slaves on the plantations and also um, producing the sugar and molasses and the rum and the cotton and coffee and all the commodities that were then to be shipped back to um, Liverpool. And it was Peter Miller Watson, Andrew's father, who was in charge of that entire operation. So I'd found some deposits at um, various different libraries of paperwork from these individuals and I'd built a family tree. So I'd started to see who they were and how they were all um, interconnected. Um, they all intermarried with each other as the Victorians did and kind of maintain the business as, as a family concern. So once I'd got those familial connections understood, it remained for me to then start looking at the business connections and to see who owned what. So um, <clears throat> my family in Berbice were living on land that was passed down from my grandfather. Um, and that land was part of what was previously a plantation called the Woodlands Plantation, um, which was um, sort of north of, the main sugar refinery on the Bear Beast River, which was the Blairmont Sugar Refinery. So they had a system of canals that would lead from all the various different cane plantations. They would put all the stuff on barges, pull it along the canals, and then get it to Blairmont Sugar Refinery, refine it in Blairmont, and then put it onto the ships on the Bear Beast River and send it out into the Atlantic. So that area was a very significant area. Um, and obviously the operations that... Um, Sandbach Tinney, as the company was called, uh, had um, depended upon those refineries and getting their sugar to those refineries and onto their ships to get it out. They had a fleet of ships as well. Mm. So that land um, was very significant land because it was right on the river. 
um, and it was right next door to the main sugar refinery. So um, to find out that um, Teacher Watson, who's a schoolmaster, had like acres and acres of land, which was then passed down to his children. My father should have had a share, but he was cheated out of it by um, Teacher Watson's um, stepson. Um, he took my father's share. His name's uh, uh, James Smith, um, who I met also when I was there. And he kept me on the doorstep and he said, oh, sorry, I can't let you in, you know. And then proceeded to not give me the information I needed. Um, but he'd obviously taken my father's share of the land, which I particularly didn't care about. I was more interested in finding out the significance of the land because that land was the connection to the Scottish ancestry. Yeah. And I wanted to find out um, who my father inherited that land from. So um, with Aline, who was my first cousin, who was 82, her daughter, Ada May, had not grown up with her mum. She'd grown up with her grandmother, Henrietta uh, Smith, who was um, uh, um, my, my grandfather's um, wife. And um, as such, Henrietta had told her lots of information, including a story about three white men, you know, the three Scottish white men, but she didn't know the names. But what she did know was that um, uh, my grandfather's grandmother, who was probably a slave, was called Nanny Ben. And um, they just knew her as Nanny Ben. And that uh, her husband was a white man called William Watson. So from that <clears throat> oral history, I had the connection to Peter Miller Watson's brother, William Robertson Watson, who we know was a plantation overseer. So then it remained to understand whether the plantation of Woodlands was actually under the ownership or the management of the Watsons. Um, and that's where the, 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 the twist came for me because I discovered an archive of documents uh, which came up for sale on eBay, which I purchased um, from the 18th and 19th century, which was actually the plantation and accounting records of the entire mercantile operation, slave operation of Sam Tinney and Company, uh, with records from 1808 onwards um, to 1880. And within that, lo and behold, the Woodlands Plantation was one of their plantations. And at the end of slavery in 1834, the official end of slavery, slavery continued after that. Um, in 1834, they received compensation and the man who received the compensation for the slaves on Woodlands Plantation was the man called Charles Stuart Parker, who was also a family member. He'd married into the family and um, he was one of the three principal um, exponents of, of the San Baxitini operation. Charles Stuart Parker managed the Glasgow operation that built ships and, and, and provided the insurance and the underwriting. Um, and Samuel Sandach was <coughs> in Liverpool and did the commodity broking and, and uh, commissioning of all the ships to, to get the slaves. And Peter Miller Watson managed the entire operation out there. But it, it's clear that we know that William Robertson Watson was a, a plantation overseer. But we haven't been able to yet understand which plantation he was overseeing. But we know that Peter Miller Watson was in Demerara, that there are another group of Watsons in central Guyana, in Mayakoni, which is in the middle. And then <clears throat> there's another group of Watsons in Berbice, which is in the east. So you've got one in the east, one in the west, and one in the middle. Um, and we know there's three brothers. So I know at least one of them was in. Demerara running operations, that was Peter. Okay. So, so so Henry or William were in one of the other two. So all this all this amazing information is what you're now <clears throat> going to be is now going to be the subject of your PhD at yeah. Cambridge University. So, one question. You live here, you've got family here, children. <laughs> Why Cambridge and not Liverpool? Um, I was accepted to Cambridge, Liverpool, and Manchester University. Right. Um, I applied for funding for all three and was uh, not successful. Um, Liverpool would have been very kind of low-hanging fruit because it's here and my archive is here, but also Liverpool University also has archives. Um, Manchester would have been more convenient. Cambridge was off the beaten track. Um, however, there was a, a supervisor at Cambridge University, Dr. John Henry Gonzalez, um, who has written a book on the Moors of uh, Maroons of Haiti. Mm. And it was after doing a seminar in 2017 at Cambridge University that I was invited to apply for a PhD there. And my work became known to Dr. Gonzalez. And Dr. Gonzalez has been incredibly supportive of me um, since then in terms of um, providing access 
um, to me at Cambridge and given me the opportunity to, um, to, to make a successful application. Um, and so he was really the one that tipped the scales for me in terms of wanting to be supervised by him. Um, but also, um, I have now been, um, I'm announcing it here today, I have now been successful uh, in my funding as well. And I've just got a full scholarship from Cambridge, which actually came through on Friday. Um, so, yeah, I'll be, I'll be starting Cambridge to do my PhD in Guyana's sugar and slave uh, trade in uh, during the period of 1790 to 1840. And I start that this October. Great. So we've heard about you as a... As a student, as a poet, we haven't heard any poetry, which we won't now because sadly we've run out of time. But how do people find out more about you? And um, you can find me on Twitter um, and Instagram at Malik and the OGs, OGS. Um, you can find me on Facebook forward slash Malik and the OGs, um, or you can just Google me Malik Al Nasser, A L N A S I R, poet, and you'll you'll find a bunch of stuff there. Thank you very much, Malik. It's been wonderful. Um, thank nice you for joining us, everybody. Um, uh, Blackfest have another event this Saturday, 15th of August at 1 p.m. at Sefton Park Palm House. Um, so join us there. Um, there's also a digital festival, uh, Blackfest, between the 21st and 27th of September. And you can find out information about all this at blackfest.co.uk. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.